What's up everybody? Welcome back to Make It Custom. I'm Carl Fisher and uh, I got another great video for you today. It's one that is gonna be a double feature because I've got two shorter videos that predate our YouTube channel. It was where I was kind of just trying to get used to, you know, uh, being on camera and that sort of thing. You'll see I'm, I'm, I'm definitely a little bit tighter than I am now. I was always very nervous to start YouTube, so I was trying to put out these little videos and teach little things. You'll see the camera works terrible, the editing's horrible. It might be a little bit better than it really truly was because I edited it and I think Christina will probably try and edit it a little bit better because <laughs> it's sort of bad. But yeah, that was back when I was, before Christina was doing the editing and all that kind of stuff. So you'll get to get a little bit of a glimpse of, you know, the shy Carl before, before now. But the first video is about hammer forming with an air hammer. We've talked about hammer forming with an air hammer here before, but I just wanted to reiterate like how many different uses there are for it. Like the one video that we did, hammer forming in a wooden buck and I used an air hammer, this air hammer right here, and I used it right in the grooves of our wooden hammer form to make beads. That's something that you can do, but you can also do a lot of other things with it. So I've got this hammer head here. It's like a, almost like a planching hammer head, but a little bit smaller. And I'll actually use that to hammer over bends on metal, like even stuff that's kind of thick, even, you know, eighth of an inch you can do if you've got a pow powerful enough air hammer. So this is my kind of powerful air hammer. It's a, it's a jet brand, just a little bit bigger one. You know, the bigger the air hammer, usually the longer the air hammer can, like the actual piece of metal that hammers inside here can gain momentum. So usually they hit a lot harder. So this one, this one could destroy some metal, right? Like you just rip right through sheet metal with this, but as long as you regulate it, you can, you can do different things. Here's one that I've used before. It's just for beading or, or whatever. I just kind of smoothed it over in the end. This one's a, a planishing head that I use to, to fold over pieces of metal. I've got a couple other ones I've, you know, put things on before. And these are mostly just, you know, like you can see where I've just welded it here. I've just weld a chunk onto the end of an existing air hammer bit, I should say. Here's another one that's kind of like a, almost like a crease I was trying to get into a panel. So you can get creative with air hammers. Like air hammers can do a lot of stuff for you. You can make, you know, stationary tools with them and, and all that. But this first video is about hammer forming a body mount. So I was making like caged nuts. I was doing all kinds of little things where I'd clamp a piece of metal and bend over with the air hammer. So I hope you enjoy that one. Um, yeah, check it out. And then uh, once that one's done, we'll wrap it up and we'll get into the, the next one, which is bead rolling. You're gonna love this one as well. What's up everybody? So today I'm gonna talk about hammer forming and press forming. So we've got this roached, roached body mount. It's made out of 14 gauge. It's got a couple of pieces. There's a captivated nut for the body mount here. And uh, we're gonna make all these pieces today. I sort of cheated a little bit because I've got a machine that'll do it, but these are our hammer form dies. This is made from three quarter inch plate. I've templated each side of this mount. You can see here, the tabs that need to be folded are all on here. I'm gonna make it out of three pieces. So one side here, one side here, and then a bottom piece will butt weld and take this as one. The first thing that we're gonna do is actually sandwich this piece of metal in between these two pieces of three quarter. Now I've drilled these holes as alignment pins in all these pieces so that they're all the same. Now these pins here should drop in through our plates here. It's a pretty snug fit. I have to give them a little tap. Now that's going to keep our hammer form aligned. So a couple of these are going to be bent the one way. This attaches to the uh, sub rail inside this 1974 Chev Blazer. It's the full convertible top one. They don't actually make a really high quality part. They're, um, they're all 16 gauge, which is a little bit light. The metal itself is a little bit weaker so that their dies can 
can be a little bit cheaper and they can pump them all out. So we're gonna make them out of good material today. So right here you can see these edges are gonna get folded out, these three. This bottom edge is gonna get folded in and that's gonna weld on to our final piece here. Now the reason we are gonna do this on a hammer form and not a break is a couple reasons. One is that there's actually a slow curve here. You can't do that on a break, obviously. The other is that this has a bend in here. You could do that on a break, you could weld it, but hammer forming is the way to go. Once we've got those pieces bent up and then these pieces welded in, we've got the caged nut. So it's a square piece of half inch that we've tapped to half inch as well. It's inch and a half square. That is our actual body mount nut. It's captivated by this cage that welds into the actual brace, that piece is gonna be our cage. So we've actually got a bit of a press form that I've made up, kind of cheap and easy. I'll show you how to do that as well. And once we're done, we're gonna have a perfect mount. Hammer form it. You can do this with a hammer. Um, I like to use the, um, the flat head of a rivet setter on my air hammer, and that's just because I'm lazy and uh, I don't want to hit this 2,000 times. I want this to hit it 2,000 times. I'm going to clamp it in the vise. See which side I'm going to start from. This is that slow curved edge, which you obviously can't do with a brake, but because these are 3 quarter inch thick solid steel dies, that sheet metal is going to do whatever we tell it to with this hammer. So here we go. So there you have it, it's exactly what we need. We just need three more. All right, so I've got the uh, pieces all hammer formed. My gimbal's been giving me a bit of trouble, so selfie mode it is. These pieces, all done, all four look great. Now I've kind of mocked one up here with some clamps. This is exactly how we're gonna put it together.
All right, we're done building these body braces. Here's our roached one. Terrible piece of garbage. Aftermarket also has questionable stuff available. Ours are 14 gauge, just like factory. We've got the cage nut inside, all formed on the press. Uh, we hammer form the side pieces, TIG weld the center, and there they are, fully done. Now, why would I make a Chevy body mount for a square body Chev? <laughs> you can buy them for 30 bucks. Well, the reason being is that uh, during COVID and stuff, like I guess um, it was just a bit of a part shortage. We could only get the really cheap ones and they were kind of too cheap to put in this build that we were doing. So I made them and uh, had a blast making them. And, and I hope you enjoyed that and got a little bit of something out of there. Like, it's just amazing what you can do with an air hammer. Um, you know, all the different ways that you can use it and how easily it folds thick metal over, you know, like it's, um, hopefully it just got you thinking a different way. Like I'm sure it applies to so many different projects and, uh, it'll save your, save your carpal tunnel, you know, elbow, elbow health issues, <laughs> I guess. I don't know. Don't forget to like, click subscribe, all that kind of stuff. Let's jump into the bead rolling video because it's a pretty fun one. And, uh, it was all for a 32 fiberglass roadster that, uh, we had a little bit of a hand in. It was a buddy's car, pretty neat little car. Actually. I wish I had more, um, more pictures to show you guys of it. It had a, you know, a, a inline six GMC 302, which is like an old drag racing kind of, um, six cylinder that you would have used like the biggest displacement, biggest stroke engine. And it had a bunch of really cool parts on it like even though it was a fiberglass roadster the engine was like so nostalgia so period came out of a dragster had five carburetors on a six cylinder engine um just just wicked but um anyway let's jump into that we did the full metal interior for that car and uh i hope you enjoy it so i'll see you right after this video what's up everybody so today i'm going to show you how to do some bead rolled aluminum interior panels so i got a customer that uh, we did a bomber seat for his 32 roadster a while back he sent me a bunch of templates of the rest of his interior and uh, we're just going to template them out on uh, 040 aluminum and bead rolling Now that everything's cut out, one of the things that you gotta look out for when you make your templates is that you've got this side out. This sheet is protected on one side, so if you have your template upside down when you cut, then it's gonna be the scratched side of the panel that's facing out when you install it. Make sure to watch out for that. Other than that, the better the panel um, template, the better the actual panel. So, Try and be as precise as you can. I like using poster board rather than thick cardboard, but my customer sent me this, so some of the radiuses on the edges aren't, you know, perfectly drawn in here, so I'll do that as we go along and make sure everything's nice and clean, but uh, overall, the, the template's pretty good. He's blacked out areas where um, his hinges are and where I can't put any screws or, or do anything like that. He's also included the latch plate itself for his, um, his his door opener latch, and I'm gonna actually bead roll around that and just kind of make it purpose rolled so that uh, everything kind of looks super nice. So I think for a design, I'm just gonna go with, um, since this is the top, I'll probably end up having a panel up top on both, or you know, all these panels that has the diamond tufting effect in it. I might have another panel at the bottom that carries through all of them. We'll kind of see, these panels are kind of small, so, we're not gonna get too crazy with them, but uh, a few dimple dyed holes where there's a recess in his doors. Uh, he mentioned that he'd like, and I think that's gonna look cool, so time to uh, lay him out.
All right, so layout's all done. We've got our patterns down, we've got diamonds on everything. The uh, one key thing I wanted to show you guys is that when you're transferring a pattern across multiple panels, you wanna have a start line. So this lower line here is the start line for these panels. We've got another parallel line up here. You don't want a pattern like this ending on the other side or shy of the opposite line on the panel. I want these diamonds to connect, you know, with points. So all these are done. Front little kick panel here didn't quite go all the way to the top, so I still had to measure all the way to the top when I was laying it out. So everything will line up when it's back in the car. So panels are done. They, uh, they turned out really, really nice. I'm super happy with them. Unfortunately, I lost a little bit of the footage while doing some of the rolling, so you didn't end up seeing me do these, uh, these dimples and, and uh, some of the perimeter rolling. One thing I wanted to point out is that a question everybody asks me is how do you keep the panel from warping? Well, there's not really a good answer for that um, that I can give you because no matter what, if you apply pressure into a panel and start forming it with a, a roller or anything, the panel is going to react. So one of the ways that I found really helpful to keeping a panel flat is that it's the process and the steps and the order you roll that makes the difference. So I always start out with the diamonds first because they actually end up curling the panel quite a bit, which you could probably see in some of those time-lapse videos, is that the panel will start to curve along the lines that you roll into it. And as you're doing that, you end up having to um, kind of massage the panel back to keep it flat enough to keep it in the roller. So after you do that, then I like to frame it with these other rolls. Once this is done, we'll run the frame. It helps keep it a little bit flatter that way. And then the final outside frame, which again, locks it in. But what you end up with is a little bit of a wavy frame. This frame of the metal is trying to hold its shape, but as you're forming the center parts, it's shrinking it, essentially, or, or stretching it and putting tension in. So what really helps that are these dimples. These dimples basically collect some of the metal and allow that metal to, to shrink around the frame, which allows the panel to come back flat. That's how I do it. I know there's a bunch of different people that do it a bunch of different ways, but this is what works best for me, and hopefully you learn something and check out my next video when it comes out. All right, so I know we lost a little bit of footage there, but I'm gonna explain it all right now, so hang tight. This is the tipping wheel that I used for doing the quilts on that. It's just a sharpened little wheel. You can make this if you want. It's just a tube and you know a piece of plate or some guys use just a washer. You can make these things if you want. The lower wheel, a lot of guys use a skateboard wheel. Mine's just like a rubber wheel that I can't find right now, but it's just a soft rubber wheel and you're pressing this into the soft rubber wheel. So that's, that's explaining that. As far as tipping the bead that went all the way around the panel, which is unfortunately the footage that we did lose, I just use these Eastwood tipping wheels. They've got this little step in them and they work awesome. You know, you're not fully pressing them like that to make the step, you're just pushing down and pushing up, making a little bit of a jog, and that's all that is. You can adjust them for the size of the jog by moving them apart or closer together, that sort of deal. When I like the bead roll stuff, like, I know I was explaining that you can't really control distortion. Well, you can, and I'm sure I'm gonna hear it in the comments, you can English wheel areas that you're gonna be tipping or beading when you're bead rolling, and that will help. Um, you can even use your bead roller to do this stretching. You could use a bead die against a flat and just run right along a bead or right along a step and it would stretch that material a little bit and it would help control distortion after you actually step it because there'd be a little bit of extra material there for you. 
I personally don't like doing that because I love the finish that comes on brand new sheets of metal. I love, you know, like that metal I was using there was 040 that was covered on one side and protected. So if you are very careful and you just only touch the metal with the bead roller where you're doing the work, it just looks so beautiful when you're done. Like you saw it, it's, it's beautiful. So I don't like to do the pre-stretch stuff because it can kind of get, you know, you can get scratched up and stuff. And I mean, I'd be fine with it on steel. That's not uh, supposed to be like a, a shiny decorative panel. My personal hot rod, I use uh, brass and aluminum and I, I don't want to sand that to, to get, you know, to make it look brushed or anything. I want it to be polished or to be as shiny as it can be. And that is why that dimple dye tool is so important because it collects and shrinks that frame. If I can uh, explain it a little bit better, you put all this stress into the panel and that frame has no stress on it, right? So your sheet is like this, your frame is all the way around and it's untouched. It doesn't have any bead rolls going through it. So you start, you know, bead rolling all this stuff and it's pulling the panel in, but that frame cannot go anywhere. So it starts to wrinkle and warp. And what the dimple die tool does is when you hit that together and make the dimple for the screw hole, which you need anyway, and which already looks cool, it is shrinking little bits of that frame to get the frame slightly smaller. Like it almost like shrinks it a little bit so that it's on the same playing field or the same tightness as the rest of the panel. And that's why it can lay flat. I wish that and I will do this in a future video. I wish that I showed you guys first how warpy it was and how after I dimpled it all, it went back down flat. Hang tight, I'm just gonna grab that dimple tool, show you guys the dimple tool. So I did make this dimple tool on an earlier video that, uh, that you can go look for if you like, but basically it's just a little hammer tool that I've lathed a male and female or turned a male and female and you can just drill a 3 16 hole, stick the panel on there and smack it with a hammer. It will make that recess for countersinking taper head screws. And that's what collects all that metal. That's that. I hope you guys enjoyed this little double feature today. Um, I think uh, they're both some really great techniques that can be used in a lot of different ways. Thanks a lot for watching everybody. Don't forget to like, click subscribe, hit notifications, and give some shout outs to some other great Canadian content creators. DD Speed Shop, Bad Chad, Fitzy's Fabrications, Half-Ass Customs, Blondie Hacks. Check out all these channels because they are all just a wealth of information and pretty entertaining. I, I like watching them all, so um, yeah. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks a lot for watching. Stay tuned for the next one. We'll catch you later.